The Soviet authorities heavily edited the text of Vasily Zaitsev's notes of a Russian sniper, claiming that he was already a sniper by the mid-October period, and had been the person to start the sniper movement in Stalingrad. But none of that was true. He hadn't taken up the sniper rifle yet, and he hadn't started the movement. And you can see hints of this within Zaitsev's text. One of the big clues is that his main account contradicts what he said in a published article in 1943. In that article, he says he picked up a sniper rifle on the 7th of October 1942. Yet, in his main text, he describes the action between the 16th and the 21st of October 1942, and says that it was during this period that he first picked up a sniper rifle. And this does two things. One, it proves that his text, and his entire story, is untrustworthy. And two, it proves that he hadn't started the sniper movement. We now know that Alexander Kalentiev had started the sniper movement in early October, and in the 1943 article, Zaitsev himself admits that he was trained by two other snipers, one of which was Kalentiev. So, if Zaitsev had started the movement, how could Kalentiev be the one who trained him? Surely it would be the other way around. You'd think he'd actually state the exact date that he first picked up a rifle, but no. And this leads us to more contradictions. First, Zaitsev takes a good 30 pages to describe the events from the 16th of October up until the 24th of October, and then he suddenly and randomly jumps back to the morning of the 16th of October to tell us a story of him visiting Chuikov's headquarters. I've said this before and I'll say it again, events written out of order are a big clue that something's up. So it turns out that on the 16th of October, Zaitsev received a medal for his bravery from Churikov, and obviously being the sniper hero of Stalingrad, it would be silly to miss that event out. So Zaitsev describes the visit. I remember my encounter with our army commander, Colonel General Vasily Chuikov. This happened immediately before a battle launched by the enemy on the morning of the 16th of October. So, it was 24 hours after Chuikov had had the crisis of confidence that we talked about in the last episode. He then says... Churikov had invited several of us to his bunker to receive awards. Churikov regarded us. He was a short, dark man with wavy hair and a very intense gaze. He spoke that morning with a surprising calm. Why was it surprising? Is it because he was genuinely calm? Which was surprising, given that he was known for his violent temper and was also in the middle of a major crisis? Or is it because Chuikov wasn't calm, but Zaitsev couldn't write that? So he said he was calm, which would then be out of character and therefore was surprising. Either way, Chuikov said... By defending Stalingrad, we're tying the enemy hand and foot. The outcome of this war and the fate of millions of Soviet citizens, our fathers, mothers, wives and children, depend upon our determination to fight here to the bitter end. This does not mean, however, that we should let ourselves be guided by foolish bravery. Our resolve to fight amid the ruins of Stalingrad under the policy not a step back is fulfilling the mandate of the people. How could we ever look our fellow countrymen in the eyes if we retreat? Well, who mentioned anything about retreat? Nobody mentioned retreat. Zaitsev doesn't mention it. Nobody else is thinking about it. The only reason Churikov said this was because he was thinking of it. And this could be another clue about Churikov's crisis of confidence. Anyway, Zaitsev says, I felt the general was directing his question to me. He knew that I had been born in the Urals, and knew that my family, grandfather, father and mother, as well as many of my comrades, were there now. No, there was no way I could face them, my eyes filled with shame and disgrace, if we were to give up Stalingrad. I answered the general, we have nowhere to retreat. For us, there is no land beyond the Volga. Apparently, it was this that prompted Churikov to issue his famous order on the 16th of October 1942, where he announced... Soldiers and officers of the 62nd Army, there is no land for us beyond the Volga. The army loved the fact that this was a slogan coined by a soldier and publicised by a commander. It passed from unit to unit by word of mouth, said Sergei Zakharov. Okay, but how did Chirikov know that Zaitsev had been born in the Urals? How did he know that his family were there now? 
Why would he know anything personal about some random soldier in the 62nd Army? Zaitsev wasn't famous yet. He hadn't even picked up a sniper rifle yet, so Chuikov didn't know who Zaitsev was. Again, this is where the propaganda comes in. Zaitsev only says that he got his medal for valour. And because of the order of events in the book, it implies that it was because of his skill as a sniper that earned him the medal in the first place. But Zaitsev hadn't picked up the sniper rifle yet, so he couldn't have earned it for that. Then he describes how he went sniping after meeting Chuikov, and then, during his sniping, he recalls what Chuikov had said to him at this meeting, or at least it's implied that it was at this meeting. The work of a sniper is not to wait for the enemy to stick his head up, but to force the enemy to show himself, and then without delay to put a bullet in his head. But why would Chuikov tell him this? Zaitsev hadn't picked up the sniper rifle yet, so why would Chuikov talk to him about the work of a sniper if he wasn't a sniper? He wouldn't. But by placing the events out of order to show that Zaitsev started the sniper movement, and also imply that he got a medal because of his sniper abilities, and imply that Chuikov knew about his skills, this forced the Soviet authorities to shoehorn in a bunch of stuff about the sniper movement that simply couldn't have happened yet, and that's why they did it out of order. This is why I don't quote from Zaitsev much, and why I won't recommend his book, because his memoirs are completely untrustworthy. Yes, there's probably some truth in here. I do think Zaitsev met Chuikov on the morning of the 16th, and I do think Chuikov said about not thinking of retreating, because that would fit in with what else was going on. But the other bits of this event are probably false. And in the rest of his memoirs, events are written out of order, there are blatant exaggerations, and it contradicts what he recorded elsewhere. We'll come back to discuss the famous sniper duel, but... The lesson here is that when you boast, exaggerate, or inflate the narrative to push your particular agenda, you make mistakes. And those mistakes make your entire narrative questionable. So don't do it. So anyway, as Zaitsev was meeting Chuikov, heavy artillery and Stuka strikes pounded the Soviet lines. Then, Group Yenika advanced once more, this time at 0800 hours on the 16th of October. Berlin had managed to get several more tanks across the Volga, and they now offered stubborn resistance in their dug-in positions. Several German tanks were knocked out in a few minutes, and these blocked the path of the other vehicles and infantry coming up behind them. This is, in fact, one of the rare instances where the Soviets destroyed more panzers than they had suffered losses. 17 panzers were lost, to 16 Soviet tanks taken out. Of course, this would have left the Soviets with just four tanks, but with the reinforcements, Berlin still had several tanks left, perhaps a dozen. Unfortunately, these dozen weren't going to be enough to prevent the Germans from moving forwards later in the day, although Isiev notes that this delaying action was significant enough to later allow elements of the 138th Rifle Division to cross the Volga and reinforce the shattered line in the north. So, had this delay not occurred, it's likely that the Germans would have swept south. Still, the Germans did move forwards. Near the Volga, the 118th Guards Regiment, having just been reinforced by a March battalion, was forced back, and Chuikov's security troops were also battered too. The 14th Panzer Division and the 577th Regiment overran the 90th Regiment and the Training Battalion, and forced the 161st and 241st Regiments back as well. Then, the 103rd Panzer Grenadier Regiment and the 576th Infantry Regiment reached the Barricade Factory, capturing a northern section of it by the evening. Just as the Germans reached the factory, though, Soviet artillery fire opened up, and the 650th Rifle Regiment counterattack. It was these two events that stalled the German advance. But I'd like to highlight the 577th Infantry Regiment again, and let you know that it was on this day, the 16th of October 1942, at this point, just as they were entering the northern section of the Barricade Factory, that this famous photo of the German officer was taken. 
In Jason DeMarc's fantastic book, Island of Fire, he explains that this previously unknown officer has been identified. It was Oberleutnant Friedrich Winkler, 33 years old, who commanded the 6th Company of the 577th Infantry Regiment. Jason DeMarc has other photos of Winkler in his Island of Fire book, pages 114 to 115, so pick it up if you want to see more of Winkler or hear more about him, including the story about his broken assault badge. Anyway, despite artillery, rockets, stukas, and support from Pickert's flak guns, Biesemann's pioneers and the Stugs of 244th Sturmgeschütz Battalion came up against stiff resistance and were shocked by the sudden ferocity of the fighting. They'd had an easy time in the past couple of days, but now had to move forward slowly as Soviet rifles and machine guns kept their heads down. A Soviet spotter called in an artillery barrage upon the 305th Pioneer Battalion, and under this hail, Major Beesman was blown to pieces. He was then replaced by Hapman Traub. Other platoon leaders and officers were wounded or killed during this fighting too, as the 577th Infantry Regiment clawed its way through the western part of the factory. But the 576th and the Pioneer Battalion were stalled way before this, and the confused fighting continued until darkness. There was a big issue on the German side, which isn't really discussed in the books. Paulus's third offensive had been designed to go north, into the tractor factory area. Now they were pulling forces away from this area and sending them south. But the Germans simply hadn't had enough time to move all their forces from the tractor factory area, with some trickling in in the afternoon, and others not actually reaching the line at all on this day. Plus, somebody had to guard the Volga a task given to the 389th Infantry Division. So, because Palace's offensive had originally been designed to head north, and it had been successful, this left them without a concentration of force against the Barricade Factory area. And, if you think about it, Paulus now faced a dilemma. And I'd like to hear what you would do in this scenario. You can keep going north and destroy Group Gorokov around Spartanovka, which would free up numerous forces in the north and also relieve pressure on the 14th Panzer Corps. But doing this would reduce the amount of forces in the south, and therefore you wouldn't have enough troops to strike into the Barricade Factory. This would give Chuikov time to bring up fresh reserves and block you, forcing you to launch yet another breakthrough attack. Or you could neglect the north and send everything you had spare to the south. This would allow Group Gorokov to survive and tie up some forces in the north, but would hopefully allow you to take advantage of the momentum you'd gained in the previous days to strike into the Barricade Factory area before Chirikov had time to establish a proper defence. So, what would you do? Well, Paulus decided to do the latter. He moved everything he could south, hoping to maintain the momentum. But there was an unintended consequence. His forces couldn't redeploy south quick enough to maintain the momentum on the 16th of October. We now know that this afforded Chirikov just enough time to get reinforcements across the Volga. More on that shortly. But obviously, Paulus wouldn't have known that at the time, so... Was this a mistake on Paulus's part? Should he have kept going north, or was this the correct decision? In hindsight, it makes sense to finish off Group Gorokov first, because Chuikov was about to establish an admittedly shaky defence of the Barricade Factory area. But that's in hindsight. Paulus wasn't to know that the momentum would be lost by the time the troops were redeployed. So, at the time, he may have made the right decision. It also appears that Paulus believed that Group Gorokov would be destroyed on the 17th of October. The remaining Russian forces were surrounded. Their destruction is planned for the 17th of October. Slight spoiler, they weren't. What I really like about this, though, is that the initial success of Paulus's third offensive, where he took the tractor factory area, actually led to the momentum of the offensive being lost. The success of Phase 1 of Palace's offensive placed the units in the wrong place for Phase 2, and led to the dilemma we've just described. 
maybe this is what we could actually describe as a lost victory. Manstein will be proud. To the north, above the Mechetka River, Group Gorokov continued to hold out as Group Krumpen launched another assault at noon. But by this point, the Germans were exhausted. The 124th Rifle Brigade did lose some of its positions in the northwest of Spartanovka, mainly because it had run out of ammunition, but otherwise the Germans didn't get very far. Yeremenka, though, was concerned and promised to send reinforcements to Gorokov, knowing full well that it would take several days to get them to him. Stalin, meanwhile, ordered the Red Army General Staff to message Chirikov directly, demanding to know the reason why Chirikov had abandoned the tractor factory so quickly and what he was going to do now. At the same time, Chirikov was getting flooded by messages from his units asking for help. And since he had nothing to give them, he had no choice but to order his units to fight with everything you've got, but stay put. Stalin had previously demanded that Yeremenko go and speak to Churikov in person and find out exactly what was needed to win the battle. So Yeremenko and his deputy Popov crossed the Volga on the night of the 16th of October. Churikov went to meet them at the landing stage. Everything around us was exploding. The noise was deafening. German six-barrel mortars, Werfe, were keeping the Volga under incessant attack. Hundreds of wounded were crawling towards the landing stage and the ferry. We often had to step over bodies. Not knowing where the boat with the front commander would land, we walked up and down the bank and then returned to the dugout. To our surprise, Generals Yeremenka and Popov were already at the command post. Yeremenka had also had to walk past the wounded soldiers who were crawling back towards the Volga. Several of his own aides were killed by explosions as he made his way to the 62nd Army's headquarters, but Yeremenka himself had survived. It was a wretched picture that they had found. The command post dugouts had been turned into craters with logs sticking out of the ground. Chuikov asked for more units and bullets, and Yeremenka promised to provide him more ammunition. But then, the next day, Yeremenka had to inform Chuikov that his ammunition allocation had to be cut even further. Thanks, Yeremenka. When Chuikov asked for more reinforcements, he specifically requested that he be sent smaller units than divisions. This might be because small units were better suited in urban combat, or it could be because there were no divisions left, it's not clear. Either way, Yeremenka had little to give Chuikov now, and could only offer him and the other generals in Stalingrad emotional support. He rang Rodmistrov and Guriev to speak to them, and then sat next to General Zolodev as the commander of the shattered 37th Guards Rifle Division tried to explain what had happened to his division. By this point, there was nothing left of it. He had lost thousands of men in a matter of hours. So, it's no wonder that Zolodev now broke down and cried as he related his story to Yeremenka. Yeremenka had to console the general, then he ordered Churikov to move his army headquarters to a safer position elsewhere in the city, and that was it. Yeremenka slipped back across the Volga on the morning of the 17th of October. Thanks, Yeremenka! Thus, Chuikov was left to nail together some sort of defence around the Barricade factory. Chuikov realised that the 95th Rifle Division wasn't a division now, and was merely the collection of shattered remnants of several battalions. He therefore instructed Gorishny to consolidate his division into the 161st Regiment, and withdrew it to a position west of the Barricade factory. Also that evening, the 650th Regiment was ordered to prevent the enemy from entering the factory, which it had already failed to do since the Germans were in the northwest parts of it already. This suggests that the Soviet command didn't know exactly where the front lines were at this time. The good news was that the rest of Ludnikov's 138th Rifle Division had, by now, crossed the Volga and had begun to take up positions in and around the factory. 
There was hardly any room left in Stalingrad, so Lunikov had to place his own headquarters inside the battered bunkers of the army's headquarters. Worse, his men also had to step over the hundreds of wounded soldiers who were slowly crawling the opposite direction towards the landing stage, which no doubt decreased their morale, especially since some of the men in these two regiments were only 16 years old. They had to move immediately from their school desks to the hell of street fighting in Stalingrad. Ludnikov's division was both late and also hadn't fully reached its designated positions. Major Gunyaga had been ordered to place his regiment on the front line, with 344th Regiment behind the line. But as Gunyaga marched through the barricade factory, something went wrong. ICF and Jason DeMarc provide alternative accounts of what happened. Either Gunyaga mistakenly believed that he had arrived in the right place where he needed to be, and just stopped, or his unit was fired upon and was unable to reach its destination. Either way, the regiment had deployed several hundred meters back from where it needed to be, and this would have disastrous consequences for the next day. Overnight, on the 16th to 17th of October, Paulus also ordered Zylitz to reorganize his forces and to continue with the attack in the morning. So, Zylitz decided to try and encircle Soviet forces ahead of him using two pincers. The first pincer, consisting of the 14th Panzer Division, supported by two regiments from the 305th Infantry Division, would strike south towards and through the Barricade Factory, aiming for the Bread Factory. Meanwhile, the 2nd Pincer, which was the 24th Panzer Division, plus the 108th Grenadier Regiment from the 14th Panzer Division, would attack east into Skulpturny Park to destroy the Soviets there. Then they would push the Soviet remnants towards the Barricade Factory to be chewed up by the Northern Pincer. If this attack succeeded, the 138th Rifle and 37th Guards Rifle Divisions would be forced out of the Barricade Factory, the 308th Rifle Division plus elements of the 685th Regiment of 193rd Rifle Division would be encircled to the west of the Barricade Factory, and Churikov would be in a lot of trouble. However, the Germans were, by now, on their last legs. 24th Panzer Division still had 33 tanks, but most of these were currently being repaired. 14th Panzer Division was also down to 33 tanks, and there were just 12 assault guns remaining in 244th and 245th Sturmgeschütz battalions. Yes, the 84th Tank Brigade had lost most of its tanks during the fighting on the 16th, one of the rare times that the Soviets lost fewer tanks than the Germans, 16 Soviet for 17 German, but clearly, the German strength was very much depleted. Worse, there was a shortage of ammunition, especially for their 100mm and 210mm mortars. They had fired off half as many artillery shells as they had on the 15th, all because their supplies were running low. Interestingly, when Paulus visited the front on this day and spoke to Heim of the 14th Panzer Division, this is what he recorded. Support of artillery and Stukas is no longer required on the front of the 14th Panzer Division. The division requests airstrikes against very active enemy batteries on the Volga Island and the Eastern Shore. So, this could be an admission that German artillery and airstrikes were not very effective when fighting inside the factories of the city, and that the biggest problem the Germans faced was Soviet artillery from across the Volga. Paulus also reported this, the forward units also asked to transfer the anti-aircraft guns closer to the front line in order to open fire on enemy aircraft at night. While the Germans had total air superiority during the day, the Soviets had brought up reinforcements over the past week or so, and now dominated the skies at night. This is noted in a few accounts, with the Germans complaining that they could no longer rest. But, in the hours of darkness, the situation was completely different. As soon as the sun went down, and throughout each night, the German troops in Stalingrad were subject to relentless Soviet air activity. The untouchable nightly air dominance of the Russians has increased beyond tolerance. The troops cannot rest, their strength is used to the hilt. So, there were some hints that the next attack wouldn't be as successful as hoped. Meanwhile, outside the city, the 422nd Rifle Division attacked northwards against the 371st Infantry Division, 
hoping to distract the Germans at Stalingrad. But it did little on the 16th, and despite being reinforced by the 28th Separate Armoured Train Battalion, the attack failed on the 17th too. They certainly didn't affect the fighting that was going on inside the city. To the west, Soviet forces continued to assault the Romanians near Serafimovic, with the 13th, 15th and 9th Infantry Divisions successfully repulsing all the attacks. Dumitrescu asked the Germans if he could mount a local counter-attack, but the Germans refused to grant him that request. And on the 16th of October, the Stavka also published Order No. 325. This ordered that all tank and mechanised corps be employed as independent formations dedicated to manoeuvre warfare. This would prevent them from being sent in piecemeal in order to support the infantry and instead allow them to concentrate in one fist. The tank commanders were also told to only engage the German panzers when they had numerical superiority, which shows that the Red Army was finally learning from its previous mistakes. Slowly but surely, the tide of the battle was turning in the Soviets' favour. Overnight, from the 16th to the 17th of October 1942, the first instance of frost was recorded in the Stalingrad region for the first time. Winter was coming, but the cooling weather didn't halt the action, as Zeilitz's attack began at 0800 hours after a heavy artillery bombardment that lasted from 0430 hours all the way up to the time of the attack. As Stukas appeared overhead, the 103rd Grenadier Regiment sliced through the gap left by Gunyaga's 768th Regiment, and this compelled the 650th Regiment to fall back. 344th Regiment was also caught in the attack and forced to withdraw into new defences covering the western and northern approaches to the factory. Thus, thanks to Gunyaga's missed deployment, the front disintegrated and the 308th Rifle Division's command post came under attack. Gertev was forced to send his own staff into battle. And this was bad because, at the same time, the 108th Grenadier Regiment, with five panzers from the 24th Panzer Division and a company from the 54th Jaeger Regiment, also began its assault at 0800 hours. They cut through the boundary of the 347th and 685th Regiments and continued their advance to the railway junction west of the Barricade Factory. Here, they linked up with the 103rd Grenadier Regiment at midday. So, the 339th and 347th Regiments were surrounded in the Sculpturney Park area under pressure from the 26th and 21st Grenadier Regiments, plus the 276th Infantry Regiment, which attacked them from the west. The pocket then shrank and split in two. The northern pocket formed around the park itself, but luckily for the Soviets, they had already turned the park into a trench network with dugouts and foxholes, so the riflemen were able to hold out for now, and the southern pocket ran along the ravine north of school number 28, which is where the 347th Regiment continued to resist. Because the 193rd Rifle Division's flank was now exposed, Gertev was forced to throw in his training battalion to cover the gap. The 305th Infantry Division, meanwhile, ground their way forwards in what can only be described as a brutal slog. In one instance, a Soviet soldier continued to fight after being mortally wounded and managed to wound a German soldier. Then, an artillery round killed Oberst Winzer, and Hapman Putman had to take over command of the regiment, which only reached the southwest corner of the factory grounds by that evening. Ludnikov launched a counterattack with his reserve 344th Regiment, and it appears that it somehow got behind some of the German units. Maps and accounts from the time don't really reveal what was going on. Both the Soviets and the Germans mistakenly believed that they each held most of the barricade factory. In reality, neither of them did. They were actually entwined with each other inside the ruins. And accounts are so conflicted about this that it's not possible to really know who held what. For example, an NKVD regiment just seems to randomly appear at some point inside the factory. The sources don't make it clear when it arrived or where it came from, but it was made up of civilian workers from the factory itself, so it may have been here all along. 
Maybe it was one of the militia units that were in the factory, but had just been formally named and numbered. Either way, an officer from this regiment spoke of the little victories that the Soviets had within the factory. A search of the concrete installations beneath the factory's power station revealed three settling tanks full of water. This was a marvellous stroke of luck. We made use of this water and found 50 sacks of flour, 38 vats of melted butter, and several boxes of expensive cigarettes in the ruins of the stores. When the supply situation became dire, I gave the 308th Siberian Division over 35 sacks of flour and a large half vat of butter. One thing that was certain, though, is that the advance of the 576th and 578th Infantry Regiments along the bank of the Volga compelled Chuikov to move his command post once again. He moved to a new position near the tennis racket area, surprisingly close to the German lines. In the north, 389th Infantry Division had cleared the Soviets from the tractor factory and reached the southern bank of the Moraya machetka River in Gorokov's rear and the 14th Panzer Corps, 16th Panzer and 94th Infantry Divisions assaulted Group Gorokov's defences once more, pushing them back to Spartanovka and Renok. It looked like Gorokov's days were numbered, with Gorokov asking Churikov if he could withdraw across the Volga. Churikov not only refused, but sent his operations officer, Colonel Kaminin, to the bridgehead to find out more detailed information about the position on this sector. In other words, to keep Gorokov in line. And in the end, Paulus would spare Gorokov the trouble. Rather than crush the final resistance at Spartanovka, 6th Army's commander ordered Pfeiffer to move one of his regiments to the southern bank of the Mechetka River, which would allow Yenika to pull his two regiments out of the line and send them south. Paulus desperately needed reinforcements in order to take the factory district, so crushing the pocket at Spartanovka would have to wait, and Gorokov was spared. Overall, though, the day had been another disaster for the Soviets, with Paulus clearly doing a lot of damage to them. 51st Army Corps reported that they had taken 860 prisoners and captured a large number of weapons and equipment for the loss of 576 men. The 84th Tank Brigade was down to just seven tanks, all but two of which were immobile and confined to fixed positions. But German strength was, by now, practically exhausted. Every single platoon in the 305th Pioneer Battalion was now being led by NCOs, while only one company was led by an officer. 14th Panzer Division had 19 tanks from its original 33, and 24th Panzer Division was down to just four tanks. Yes, four. It was a Panzer Division in all but name. Still, four tanks was better than nothing, which is exactly what was left of the 37th Guards Rifle Division. As a result of 15 days of fierce combat, the 37th Guards Division suffered 100% losses, and as a result, only the artillery regiment remains. By the evening of 17th of October 1942, the division has up to a company and a half of active bayonets. Chirikov wasn't happy, and directed his wrath at the 138th Rifle Division. He chastised Ludnikov, criticising him personally for his division's failure to even reach, let alone defend, its defensive sector. He also issued another order to the units fighting in and around the Barricade Factory to defend it without considering either retreat or failure. And Ludnikov spent the night scraping together a defence inside the factory with whatever subunits he had spare, as well as militia forces. Isiev notes that the two pockets west of the Barricade factory saved Ludnikov's units in the factory from being routed, because had the Germans not stopped to deal with these pockets, they would have had more forces facing the factory at a time when Ludnikov was simply unprepared to face them. But at the time, probably due to communication problems, Churikov believed that Colonel Gertsev had pulled his regiments back without permission, and had committed a crime against the motherland. Churikov ordered him to re-establish his old line by the morning, saying that a failure to do this would result in him being court-martialed. In reality, Gertsev hadn't retreated, but it appears that either communications had broken down, or Churikov was under a lot of pressure and just had to act. 
Either way, Gurtev did pull together a force centred around the headquarters of two of his regiments and reinforced that with 210 new replacements. It was hoped that Gurtev could use this ragtag bag of bits of broken forces to break through to the Skulpturni Park area in the early hours of the next day. The 6th Army reported that its total ration strength was 334,000 men on the 17th of October, but that its actual combat strength was just 66,549 men. Worse, a lot of these were on the flanks, not inside Stalingrad, so Paulus's forces in the city were incredibly weak, as they had been for a long time now. It also begs the question, what were all these extra mouths doing, apart from eating up precious supplies? Once again though, Paulus wouldn't let his forces rest. He ordered Xylitz to reorganise for another attack for the next morning, where he hoped to destroy the pockets and capture the barricade factory, the bread factory, and the area to the south. Now, yes, they would hopefully have the 389th Infantry Division, and the 79th Infantry Division was on their way, but it wasn't clear if they would arrive in time. Therefore, would the Germans have enough strength with their available forces to do what was needed? Could Paulus continue the offensive now that the momentum was waning? Would Yeremenko give Chuikov the reinforcements he so desperately needed? And would Chuikov and Gertev break through to the pockets in the Sculpturni Park area? We'll find out next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.